This episode of our This Week in XR podcast is sponsored by Zapper. Zapper is one of the world's leading XR companies. Over the past 12 years, they've won numerous awards for memorable campaigns. They've democratized AR by making tools and SDKs that anyone can use. And they created Zapbox, the world's most affordable mixed reality headset. Most recently, Zapper worked with Unilever to create an enhanced QR code called Accessible QR, which enables packaged goods to speak to the blind and partially sighted. If you're thinking XR, give the team at Zapper a call or visit Zapper.com to see how they can help you on your XR journey. Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlie Fink with Ted Shilowitz and Roni Abovitz. It's July 21st, 2023, and it's This Week in XR. Good morning, guys. Morning. How's everyone, morning. Charlie? Great. How's everyone I'm handling great. the heat this morning? Oh, God, it is so hot. It is so hot in Los Angeles, but I'm probably three quarters of the people that I'm listening to have said the same thing when they woke up. Yeah, and it's it's hotter everywhere else, uh, much hotter than Los Angeles. So Yeah, uh, ironically. Uh, we've got a fantastic guest today, Dan Olson, who's a, a filmmaker. Um, he has a great YouTube channel, Foldable Ideas. Uh, He had a massive, massive hit last year called Follow the Line, which was a thorough debunking of crypto, uh, which he followed up uh, with a thorough debunking of the metaverse. So uh, I I said to him that uh, we were have been responsible for at least some of the hype, although we cast ourselves as sort of wry realists, uh, I would say somebody on the outside would would include us in the vast number of people who were hyping the metaverse. So it'll be uh, interesting to have somebody from the outside come and visit us here inside of our tech bubble. Um, It was not a big news week, you guys. So uh, we'll get to a couple of stories, but um, the most exciting one actually I wrote uh, about our friend Ed Saatchi launching, uh, changing the name of his uh, studio from Fable Studios to The Simulation. And with it, they released a scientific uh, paper explaining how they created something called Showrunner. Showrunner is an AI, a generative AI, which combining a number of tools simultaneously can, is a text to episode generator. So you feed it all of South Park and some parameters and it will generate a South Park episode in minutes. Probably gut check. There there was a whole bunch of, noise and within 24 hours that the whole thing was a trey and matt hoax from south park do we have validation that this really happened um that no not not that it, not that the news event didn't happen but, but they really did build a gen ai south park generator or is it a staged hoax do we, do we know that i because i was reading all this like I, I got the paper right away. I looked at it, and then all of a Ed sudden, Ed Sachi was on the show. He couldn't talk he about Ed it on and, the show. A couple weeks and ago. I had, you know, and I was, I was away at a funeral, but uh, he couldn't talk about it. Ted, you're aware of this, aren't you? Of course, we had Is Ed on the real? show. Is it real, Ted? Well, okay, so you know, you know, Roni, where where things tread into worlds that you're very close to, and you very often on the show say, "I'd love to comment on this deeper, yeah. but I really can't right now because I work for the entity." Uh, called Paramount Global, and South Park is one of the entities that lives with, inside that on Comedy Central. Right, but they were they were quick yeah, to point South. out that it's it's fan art, and uh, it could not be mistaken for uh, the real thing. <laughs> but they're not releasing it commercially. They put it on their YouTube channel. They might even take it down after a little while uh, if the South Park people object. But it has no commercial purpose other than validating their thesis that if you feed the right uh information into the model that they developed into the you know uh, api that they developed that um it can generate original episodes of original content but charlie you did one that had charlie fink in it so well what you- they did with the south park image generator in order to yes they made a 15 minute episode with professor charlie fink visiting south park and helping the students uh you know the cast of characters at south park create their own ais which is, of course, a very silly idea, but it works in South Park. And there's a cliffhanger ending where the kids don't want to end the simulation. Now, what they did, of course, was that they trained it. They stuffed, you know, they took a bunch of my 5,000 speeches on YouTube and they just fed that into the model. 
So it mimicked my voice, but it sounded like my voice when I'm on stage. It didn't sound like my conversational voice. Now, I, I, of course, Brony, I cannot validate this like, you know, I've seen the code. I understand how it works because you know I don't. Um, but I trust, I trust Ed. Um, so I guess uh, I don't Charlie, think- Charlie, the ambiguity is this. Um, I think all three of us know that given the state of AI, it's technically possible, right? The, but but I read so many um, weird articles that people thought the whole thing was actually some big hoax and they were going through the biography of the people um, uh, on, on like the simulation and they all have these like weird fake uh, bios and people were doing all this cross-referencing of the fake bio names and like they thought it was like a big inside joke. So, so may, maybe let's leave it as a cliffhanger. Maybe we can get Ed to confirm in the next joke. week what it's, actually it's not happened. an inside joke. He's talking to people at studio. Okay. He's trying to get original IP. So okay, the, so the goal real. is to do original IP. The goal is not to rip off existing IP. And also, let me just say that there's not a lot of IP that the generator can handle right now, which is why they chose South Park. It can't do live action. It could do another style of animation, but it would have to be highly stylized and very simple the way South Park is. It's not going to make, you know, semi-realistic people like you see in a video game or an animated movie run around. It's 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 not that is years away, in my opinion. Um, but that obviously will be added to it, you know, at animation generator uh over time. But an animation generator as we all know from being in the business is ab about a lot more than making a maquette move. So, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be quite a while before it can do original live action episodes, but I don't think there's any question that that's the, the general direction of AI. Um, I Probably think, we I think what this thing? shows is what this shows is that the writer's fears, which honestly last week I would have told you were existential, Actors, a different story, but writers' fears, existential, that their real worry was what was happening with residuals and the way profits are calculated, right? Because, because the product is no longer the profit of a streaming division. The product is the stock price. And the performers and other artists don't participate in that new way of companies making money. So, you know, a company can lose money and just keep issuing more stock because the stock is the product. So the actors and the writers are being told, no, you're working for a money losing business. We can't afford to give you more money. And it's like, dude, your stock price just quadrupled. What are you talking about? That was all based on the streaming service that you say is unprofitable. So I think that this is a very, 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 very hard problem to solve. I'll bet our guest Dan has a perspective on it. Uh, so let's let's just move on to the couple of other news stories. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that one with Dan. But this is a big issue. I don't think it's a hoax. If it is, I've been taken in. I've swallowed it. I'm going to have to issue a retraction and write a giant I article about how I was duped from by somebody I've known seven years uh, and trust, even though I don't know what he's talking about much of the time. Charlie, let me just climb in here for a second to give a little perspective. I, I don't think it's a hoax either. I think the technology we have seen with large language models and this, you know, follow the next word scenario uh, is real and it can be done. And we've seen it with multiple pieces of product. I think an interesting thing to think about, you know, a part of our show is giving some interesting perspective on things, right? Is the definition of fan art and fan lore versus for-profit and I think there's a little bit of a gray line to talk about there where this particular entity and this company, and you know, you and I are friends with Ed, so I'm going to talk in a very overt fashion. Uh, and he's been on the show and you know, I've, I've known him for years through the VR sort of arc. Um, is not, in my opinion, truly fan art because if it's fan art, there is no intention of making a profit from it. You are just a fan of the material and you're putting your fandom out in the world. If it's very, very overt that your goal of this is to start a company to make money and you are using some mm. IP that is well known right. to generate froth and generate 
massive awareness because you're using and building upon massive IP to create something that you can sort of say, well, we're not going to charge money for this little entity. But at some point, someone is charging money or making money on the fact that that's on the internet. So I think that's a little bit of a falsehood already. Um, I, I, it but, is possible that that um, he talked to the guys from South Park. At some I actually don't think he talked to the guys. But, you know, Park. they're in the 30 minute episode that they generated the, yes. the you know, uh, Stone and Parker are in it, uh, uh, objecting, I should say, rather passionately. to the yeah, whole Of course, I, I don't think he talked to them. I, I think yeah. he was honest and, and truthful about that. I'm just making the point that if your goal set is to build profit, you are no longer in the world of fan art. That's right, kind of right. Okay, fair enough. That is fair enough. So here's here's a couple of other interesting things that came up. Not not a big news week, guys. Right, we're getting into the dog days of summer here. Uh, so the fable uh, simulation story was was the biggest. Um, Apple GPT, interesting. Uh, interesting little tidbit that came out this week but there's no I, i'm not surprised that apple's working on it and there have been lots of stories that apple is using yeah uh, for their own purposes uh you, for supply chain and other uh parts of their business but now it sounds like uh they are actually working on something they call ajax that they will release or integrate into their services uh but uh, not surprised uh, and I expect we're going to hear a lot more about this story. Well, and, and as a, a big, big fan of all things Apple, um, one of my frustrations is their text-to-speech algorithms are not great. You know, I love the idea of being able to talk into my phone rather than typing on the little micro keyboard. It's super efficient and valuable. A lot of people do it. It makes a lot of mistakes. And I've seen it. This is anecdotal. I've seen it go from great to good to worse for some reason. And I'm not exactly sure why it makes more mistakes now than it did five or six years ago, perhaps some privacy things and keeping things on-prem on device. Uh, but like, if we look at the Zoom transcript of this, because we do this recording on Zoom, it is remarkably accurate. It's terrifyingly accurate. Uh, and there are a lot of transcription services that land this, land yeah. this. Fireflies this absolutely nails it. Perfectly, perfectly. Yeah. And why can't, if I need to send you a text, hey, Charlie, I'll be 20 minutes late for the podcast. Why did it say, hey, Charlie, I'll be 20 minutes late for the for the, the, the pad? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, that's wrong. You know? And I know, why can't it be smart enough to start to understand your voice even when yeah. there's interference, so, right? I don't know. Rony, you feel like you've got something to say at this one, I think. Um, so, so full disclosure, very biased here because I'm, I'm working on a, a deep tech AI startup to compete with these things. But bottom line is... Um, I think there are massive innovations in computing intelligence, and, and one of them is stable diffusion, and one of them um, are these transformers. And then they have, then they hit a wall because they're not everything, right? They're, they do something, and then and then some people just pour everything, oh, this thing is it, and then, and then just and then they hit a wall, and then there's a regrouping, and there's a bit of a pause, and then there's the next innovation, right? So I, I think what's happening here is like this: the the we have made massive progress. And then we see the limit of that progress. And then there's a regrouping in R&D. And then there's the next big burst, mm. right? But people thought, oh, this thing, let's just make models as big as possible. You know, the company with the most compute, the most data wins is not necessarily true. We're seeing that the biggest models are full of hallucinations. They're not predictable. They're opaque, hugely problematic. So now people are like, oh, um, maybe that's not the direction. But we can't say that out loud yet. So we got to double down. And then people at Stanford going, oh, look at this chat GPT model. It's completely inconsistent over the course of four months. And then the scientists are like, we don't know what the hell's going inside because they actually don't know what's going on inside. Right, right, right. Too big to know what's going on. So that's the very short form. We could have an eight hour debate on this, but the short form is the models are so big and so complex, human beings don't know what's going on inside anymore. And you think Apple has the right ethical direction to make better choices there? Let me, let me just take that question from Apple aside. I think the ethical constraints around AI, no company yet has the right governance. It's actually a really big theme that I'm, that I'm, I'm, I'm worried about and thinking about right now and, and trying to build something that has that. But I, I really think ethical governance is incredibly rare in countries, in companies. We do see it in some places. Um, none of the major players have real um, benefit in the free market to have those ethical constraints other than at some point when consumers start pushing back. So uh, th th that's a very, it's a really good question, Ted. 
it's actually one we should do a whole topic on but like i think the appearance or veneer of ethics is what people care about not not actually having the right well that's cer certainly like privacy on the yeah. internet uh so performative remember performative ethics right <laughs> like all of a sudden everyone had black lives matter on their on their corporate thing because it mattered at that point um but but did they really intrinsically have it um many of them know it was a performative marketing branding activity right. that's the worry about ai because ai is actually a real thing that has all sorts of unpredictable things and in the wrong hands it is a real problem yeah. well um, you know one of the terrifying show on netflix you guys need to watch about ai and defense uh and what could happen in the mm -hmm. wrong hands uh it just mm -hmm. came out it's a great great episode what's what, what's is, I'll, what's i'll put it in the link in a sec so charlie can mention it Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip the rest of the news so we can get to Dan. That was a pretty interesting conversation. Just a shout out to Futureverse, a company I didn't know anything about. It's based in New Zealand. Ted, you're nodding. Maybe you know a little about them. They're well, trying a, to bring- synthesis a, of a lot of different companies. They're, they're trying big. to bring AI to the metaverse and it has something to do with, they rolled up some payment companies. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds, but they just raised $54 million, which in the old days used to be real money uh, that you can really build something with. Yeah. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see. We should see if we can get these guys on the show to kind of explain this. Yeah, it's because it's like a conglomerate of something. Yeah, yeah, looking at the news, I hadn't heard of them before, but it's an interesting concept. Uh, and again, it's, you know, Web3 open and, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what that means to this day. Uh, I mean, I know what the concept is. I just don't know what a website is that would deploy it. Well, anyway, let's let's bring in Dan Olson. Um, Dan is one of those people that I admired so much. I just had to reach out to him, uh, mm. you know, and, and oftentimes you'd be surprised. Uh, so many people respond to me. I don't know if they want to be in Forbes or, or whether they uh, like my background, but Dan responded. I didn't think he would and agreed to come on the show because as I said, uh, you know, he is a debunker of a lot of the things that we talk about and his uh, crypto um, uh Follow the Line movie, Debunking Crypto, uh, was a huge hit, 11 million views on YouTube. So let's see. I see Dan's in the waiting room. Dan, can you can we make you live? Do you ask want me to start, turn on yeah, my... Yeah, yeah, ask start video. Come on and join us. Great to meet you. Thank you. Hello, for welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. So uh, since, you know, Dan, usually we know people who come mm -hmm. on to the show. You know, we have a very kind of small world and uh, we invite each other on, on each other's podcasts and so forth. Um, but you are somebody, as I said at the top of the show, as somebody who's coming at us from the outside and maybe seeing us for what we are. And again, I would say we are kind of debunkers, but we're also kind of evangelists. So I, I sure, wouldn't yeah. say there's complete innocence here. Uh, we did plenty of jabbering about uh, the metaverse and crypto. I will tell you your take on crypto, the day I saw follow the line i sold my crypto <laughs> i mean if if you this, that that would be good timing because like the the weekend after that video after line goes up came out was uh was a massacre for uh for a lot of coins so that was that was not my fault that that was coincidental <laughs> timing but well uh, i think you uh you pointed uh, out in the uh, movie how uh, many vulnerabilities in this ridiculous system there was and how much of it was just floating on a cloud of, of hype and optimism. Uh, so the um, I thought, guys, uh, I would play uh, and we could play an interesting game with uh, Dan just as an icebreaker. And I saw um, uh, Will Ferrell did this when he was a guest on Smart List, the, um, the Jason Bateman uh, podcast, which we all like so much. So, yep. so this was what Will Ferrell did with them. So I'm just going to throw out tech topics, names, you name it. And just in, in round Robin fashion, um, starting with Dan and going to Ted and then Roni, uh, I'm going to give you one word and you give me hopefully one word answer or one sentence answer. Okay. Okay. So Dan, listen to that episode. I'm trying to remember exactly how it worked. It was, I think, it was a, an episode that they did live somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched it and I listened to it, but I'm trying to remember. Probably this looks like it gets better if you're drinking beer. But go on. <laughs> Let's just see what happens. We'll, I, we'll I, see. I, We're drinking coffee, not beer. Let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, all right, Dan. Elon Musk. 
sorry, some that got lost in the uh, in the the jumble of overlapping. Okay, my my first the first one is Elon Musk. Fraud. <laughs> uh, Ted Zuckerberg. Human fascination. Roni cage match. Zuckerberg Musk. <laughs> Dan Francis Haugen. Uh, my my just went completely blank. I oh she was the uh, the whistleblower who pointed out that they knew Instagram was harming teenage girls and did nothing about it. Oh uh, yeah, I've got. Um, I feel like I've used up my sentence already. Okay, <laughs> Ted Hollywood screenwriters. <laughs> wow. Okay, I don't Maybe want to put you on the spot. Right I there. just having some fun with you. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer right there. Yeah, exactly. I panic. Uh, Roni, threads. Rats. Threads. Oh, threads. Yeah. Zuckerberg lands a, a sucker punch. <laughs> and by the way, I do want to talk to Dan about threads versus twitter because i do have a thesis about that and i'm very curious when we get past our game show part here i'm very curious to hear dad's perspective i like the game show though charlie yeah you got you make it more crazy now you gotta you gotta raise it here uh okay dan venture capital <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll just go with wild cackling uh, okay. as, as my answer okay. to that uh, one yeah, i feel like that cackling. uh okay uh Ted, Activision. Huge. <laughs> Roni, um, VR chat. Slowly dying. <laughs> I would say, can I, can I add one for there? I would say organic is VR chat. Organically dying. Mm, I, don't think, I don't think it's dying. Decomposing in the woods slowly with mushrooms and rabbits feeding upon it. Dan, Jeff Bezos. Taxation. What did you say? Taxation. Taxation. Um, Ted, HoloLens. Um, so close, but no cigar. The HoloLens news this week. Uh, there's one last rodeo for the Army. And I just wonder in the end whether or not they would have been more successful with a ruggedized micro display rather than trying to take spatial computing into a combat situation. Yeah, I think, that's I think that I think they may have just bit off too much, just too hard right now. Uh, By the way, I've got a good one for all of our listeners for Jeff Bezos if they're playing the game at home. <laughs> the answer would be relentless. And then it's your job to figure out why I said relentless. And then maybe that'll be a user uh, question answer. Yeah, we, we're not getting user questions. We usually do one at the yeah, end of the show. Yeah. Um, so th there's supposedly 10,000 of you out there. So uh, help a brother out here. Uh, okay, moving on. Roni, um, SpaceX. Used to be super cool. Um, but, but because of management has lost some of its luster? I, I think... It, it, it's lo used to be super cool company, still impressive, but activities outside of SpaceX are rendering SpaceX <laughs> a little more, a little more questionable. Dan, uh, but the engineers are great. The engineers there are awesome. Dan, deep fakes. Uh, not as troubling as people think for reasons that are far more depressing. Uh, Ted, another one of your favorite subjects, Tesla. Okay. Um, here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say compartmentalized. And this actually relates to Roni's reaction to SpaceX is, and this may be a, a very large personality flaw of mine and maybe others. I am able to compartmentalize what I believe is the massive success of SpaceX and Tesla against the foibles of Twitter. So I compartmentalize. Fair enough. Um, okay, I'm running out of good ones. Here's one for you, Roni, crypto. I'll, I'll nuance it. Immense future potential, current catastrophe. 
Hmm. All right. Um, here's one, Dan, I think that might um, be a good one for you. Hype cycle. Inevitable. <laughs> Bobby that. Barzeev, who's also been on the show, gave a great speech at uh, AWE where he said, uh, bubbles don't deflate, they explode. So uh, we'll see. Do you think the AI, Dan, do you think the AI bubble, AI is a bubble that will explode? Um, AI is a lot more complex than a lot of the other hype cycles that we've seen over the last couple of years, because there is, you know, it's a lot closer to the website, uh, at, than it is to like crypto in terms of the difference between, um, uh, the claims and the product. There are a lot of like language model. Like I, I don't like using actually like I, I, I deeply resent the, the AI, uh, uh, nomenclature because it's not intelligent. It's not thinking it doesn't have, it doesn't know what a pineapple is. It, it, uh, so like large language models and, and, um, uh, generative, uh, uh, generative models and, and neural networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. Um, there, there is a like viable, like there are viable products inside of that. You know, I use language models for auto transcription, you know, um, I would like, and, uh, a lot of software, like a lot of, um, uh, video editing software is like incorporating stuff like that into it and stuff like like that, like transcription is one of those things that's been a bugbear for online video production for a decade because uh, the value of transcription in terms of like how it helps you just in your process of being able to like read your video rather than like having to like watch through it in real time, you know, you can scan through a text document faster than you you can video uh, the value to end users, um, you know, there's like the accessibility thing of like, you know, uh, uh, hard of, uh, people who are hard of hearing who need uh, who need that for assistive reasons. But then it turns out that once we started rolling out uh, captions and whatnot across like everything, and they became very accessible, tons of people who have no auditory problems whatsoever realized that like, oh, I just like watching more stuff with the with captions on because I follow it better you know, I absorb it better. And so captions are are immensely valuable to end users, but generating them is just an absolute slog. It, it is a miserable process. No one likes doing it. It requires vast amounts of, uh, of, of human labor. And even if you're good at it, um, it's slow. And so it is a, like, it's a prime candidate for something with, with immense value um, in, 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 to end users and uh, immense value in like its labor um, uh, saving. You know, you're you're taking a job away in in absolute terms, but it's not a job that anyone like right. wants to do. It's not a good job. It's not a <laughs> fulfilling job. It's it's a miserable job. That's that's difficult and slow and obnoxious uh, and untenable at the scale uh, that we that 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 text needs to be deployed at in order for it to be truly valuable because like, because captions need to be deployed like at scale in order to really truly be useful to uh, uh, useful to people. And so, you know, so that right there um, and, and people have been watching that develop, like people have hands-on been watching that develop with like YouTube auto captions and whatnot. We've been seeing like the underpinning of, of that product um develop uh in real time over uh over years we were just and talking about that before you hopped in we we don't have someone manually transcribing the show we have a technology yeah yeah the show and somebody where somebody wants to read it rather than listen to it uh us as someone who works for a big studio and all the other studios are very actively using this technology and we've actually been using forms of this technology for many generations yeah, now yeah. to uh solve that problem uh, and because it's an efficiency area and it's not a dangerous area where you're like chopping into someone's creative talents or creative use case, it is literally just a better mousetrap to deliver yeah, it is, the important part. Yeah, yeah. Generating, you know, generating transcription is just, it is like the, it is the poster child of like, here is just like grunt work that for years and years and years, you just have to brute force your way through. Yeah. Um, and, and no one's gonna, no one, like I, 
my and first you talk job like somebody who spent a thousand hours doing that <laughs> my first yeah my first job in the film industry like out of uh, out of college was generating transcripts for like was transcribing tapes for uh for um a reality tv show yeah there used to be um, companies yeah. that did this <laughs> they were literally very large companies that were transcription companies and it was yeah. mm -hmm. it's very much like the analog of the switchboard operators that we yeah. talk about that have been replaced by technology you know it's yeah so i would i would get sent uh i would i would get sent a cdr or like a stack of cdrs and i would get paid um based on how many of them i completed up to a satisfactory standard so that's a you know, so on my end, it was a direct like, all right, the faster I can do this, the more I make per unit of time. Um, and and it was just it was just all the raw tapes. So like they would go out and do a shoot day. I would get like five tapes worth of uh, worth of CDs and I would sit there and it would be the the raw transcription of like. It, so it wasn't even finished. Uh, it wasn't even finished episodes. It was the stuff that someone down the line was going to be cop was going to be chopping into. Uh, okay, into so now we episodes. know now we know now we know part of your career arc, but it feels like we've got to open that. Onion so, yeah, let's right, wait. Charlie? The other thing. The other movie that Dan made that I knew that was the follow up to follow the line. So having debunked crypto and Web3, Dan went on to take on the metaverse. Right. And, and the title of that uh, movie was The Future is a Dead Mall, Decentraland and the Metaverse. So did you hear from Decentraland? uh i not not directly i did not i did not hear directly from the decentraland foundation i did hear from a number of uh of like a couple of decentraland power users indirectly via um okay so there was like there was a vote there was a subject that came up on the decentraland dow shortly after the video came out that was very transparently like a response you know, and it, but it was trying super hard to like hide the fact that it was like, uh, that it was like a reaction to, uh, reaction to the video. But a bunch of the people like in the, in the direct replies to it made the, made the very obvious connection. And these were, these were Decentraland voters. Um, and we're like, yeah, you know, like this is just kind of, this is just kind of circling the drain. Like if we can't take these issues, if, if we can't, name these issues and take them on head on then everything that that he said was was right about us um but do, so here's a question do, do you feel like decentraland is just uh one of the many markers on the road ahead yeah so there, well so let, me, let, me, of, let me ask let me ask sure. the question because i have curiosity um decentraland to me is one of many of pieces of the world of overwhelming content that we are building that we there are not enough people and hours and times in the day to consume and participate in all of the content offerings and all of the places these digital places whether that's a movie a tv show a website a, 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 a virtual land we have just literally created too much of it and therefore a lot of these places don't become hit they're not they're ghost towns because you know they're not a hit right where pokemon go is sort of another version of some sort of virtual experiment on using technology as a place to be and that is a hit and lots of people have gone to it so i'm curious if you if you fall in one one direction or the other on this yeah so one of the reasons why i use decentraland and i say this in the video is that um that decentraland is a failure for many reasons that just like and a lot of them are just it's a bad product um you know, it, and, but that doesn't mean that we can't like learn things like we can still look at Decentraland and what it what it succeeds at, what it fails at and how it implements answers to these sort of like bigger scope questions and really like use that to reflect against the claims. Because if we take conversation about the metaverse and you go through like all of the philosophical stuff it's just this incoherent slurry of people saying things that are really exciting sounding but have no real connection to anything that a human would like use with their hands um would actually like interact with 
And so Decentraland is valuable because it's falsifiable. You can you can read a claim about like, we're going to move to the metaverse, like everything's going to move to the metaverse, we're going to like, you know, law firms are going to move to the metaverse, and you can go into Decentraland and be like, okay, well, here's a law firm in the metaverse. Um, this is a bad idea. Like this doesn't, you know, this fantasy uh, doesn't line up with it. And at the end of the day, like we've already created the metaverse. Like this is one of the big things is that like Neil Stevenson like coined the term metaverse just as like it was it was his tech word tech word for his book for what we now call the internet. Like yeah. it was the internet. You know it. Uh, uh, Neil, we, Neil, we already built it together uh, we're, we have for about Neil, a decade. So, Dan, I'm going to let you keep digging the hole, and then I'm going to jump in. But keep going. I yeah, no, no. I mean, it's more right like here. okay. So, like Neil has Neil has continued to go on and like continue to like talk about this. He has a very weird relationship to this metaverse thing. Of like, he was on the like as an author, he was on the cusp. Yeah, I will dig this hole. I will. Dig I will hole, bury myself in this great <laughs> because. Because like I did a lot, of, like I had to get caught up on a. It's like okay, what has Neil said since 1992 in relation to this topic? And so I had to read a whole, like you know, do a do a whole lot of reading, reading, reading while I was in the uh, research phase for that video. And he does have a very sort of like weird relationship to uh, to it that I think, like my my straight up opinion is that uh, he's bought his own hype in in regards to like this idea of being on the cutting edge that that it's like no this metaverse is like it's still coming it's still fomenting under the surface and it's like no it's here we built it we have it we are at the moment communicating via a medium that is effectively that metaverse that was described it just doesn't involve headsets but um dan let me i i first of all i i really as a filmmaker, uh, I think what you did was great. So you got to build an audience and you provoke. But let me let me just clear up a couple things because I worked for a decade with your with Neil. We're good friends. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. and tell me if I we're probably more in agreement than not. But let, let me say this: in 1992, when he wrote Snow Crash, he was imagining the emerging internet. Right? If you, if yeah. you think 92, it wasn't quite anything like it is now oh i rem i can describe going, it in 92 i was there yeah so he's like okay um there's this thing called the internet and, and the internet itself is not that that skeleton is still part of the metaverse but what he was imagining is it would inflate and the emergence of virtual worlds and virtual currency and people living their life with different kinds of endpoints and devices now now we're in 2023 um first of all the metaverse is not uh, if you look at if you look at these internet maps, like they show like this you know giant universe of all these little tiny dots, big websites, small websites, empty space. If any one of those dots says I'm the metaverse, like a decentraland, they're wrong. That's like a little like little empty planet floating around the far edge of the universe saying I'm the universe. The universe is all of it. And I think I think you have a couple things that are going on. One, Neil realized the people living in immersive worlds was not only going to be in a headset. He's actually said that a lot. Um, and the best best proof of that are things like Roblox, uh, things like these giant AAA uh, games like World of Warcraft. Um, Epic Fortnite, it has hundreds of millions of monthly users spending huge amounts of time in these three-dimensional virtual worlds through a 2D display, but still 3D virtual worlds. He said that was a surprise to him. He said that in public a few times. But um, the argument that you could pick on Decentraland but if you actually go look at and spend a lot of time in Fortnite, Fortnite is not the metaverse, but it is one of those pockets that shows you one day this 2D internet will become something else, but there will still be residual 2D flatland internet as well. Actually, with that, I have a counter question for sort of all of you. How much, uh, what, what's your slash played in World of Warcraft? Not anymore. I, I, I dialed out some years ago. Okay, but, but what, what, what was it? What was it? Like... Uh... If you if you logged back in, what's your high? What? Dragon Slayers seven hundred nine, some kind of weird ass like it was Dragon Slayer something or the other. So what, what was your last expansion? I'm I'm eating my shoe right now. I I I, I can't I can't. Okay, remember. so well, help me out, Jen, because I'm not a World of Warcraft. Dan's player. probably okay, a so I'm not World much of, of a gamer. Player. 
I'm I'm not much of a gamer to be perfectly honest. Okay, so so I'm the only are you, person. Are you a big World of Warcraft? It, it kind of sounds like I'm the only person here in Dan chat used who to, has like to do videos about games as well as movies. Yeah. So the thing, one of the things is, is that like, and I realized this very quickly in doing the research on on the Decentraland video was that a lot of the philosophers have very, very little hands-on experience with Fortnite. They've got like a bunch of hours, maybe. They do not have hundreds of hours. They've got, you know, they touched World of Warcraft back in uh, back in 08, back in 09. You know, they dropped off maybe somewhere in Lich King. You wouldn't uh, be talking kind about of a best case scenario. Hmm? You wouldn't be talking about Matthew Ball, though. Uh, <laughs> you know that, like, they're that it's like they've they've experienced it at arm's length, and so the the sorry, I've got like a frog in my throat. It's still no, early fine. for me. That's water. okay. Um, I wish I had a PA to get you a coffee. Sorry. I wish I had filled this water glass <laughs> yeah, before. No water. Uh, um, so a lot of them do tend to have like very like arm's length experience with these things. Like they have seen VR chat. They have maybe like used VR chat a little bit. Don't but know they anything spent about like substantial Second Life. Time. They, you know, yeah, they don't know a lot about Second Life. They know it exists. They know that World of Warcraft exists. They know it's popular. They saw the South Park episode, you know, um, but, 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 but they, they don't have a lot of. But World but so, of Warcraft's not the only one, right? Like, for example, I spent tons of time in, in Battlefield playing against friends and playing Combat Flight Simulator and weird esoteric, esoteric virtual worlds where you fly F-16s and F-18s. But those are the same idea that you're but, not. Yeah, a no. So but the, the point that I'm sort of like working towards is that a lot of the a lot of the rhetoric around the metaverse um, is is kind of philosophical arm's length and fails to understand or fails to appreciate fails to appreciate and incorporate the fact that like these online spaces are actually very well developed um they have their own internal language they have their own internal communications they have their own internal cultures and we have been looking at and studying those and the emergence of those for decades and the body of literature about like how they interact with the real world how they interact like how people manage that interface is extremely well developed and a lot of the stuff that we were seeing on the metaverse like i mean we had to cut a lot of stuff that was really just like hey here like so really the decentraland in the metaverse video is a companion to the preceding video on world of warcraft it's called world of warcraft and uh uh no, why it's why it's rude to suck at Warcraft. Um, and a lot of that video is about like is about sort of these claims of like virtual worlds, because like, you know, when Second Life first came out, when World of Warcraft first came out, it was this like, ah, people are going to like live their lives in it. And we know what live your life in World of Warcraft like actually means. It's just it's spending a lot of your time playing a video game and maybe using it as like a chat room. Uh, but the thing is, is that at the end of the day, like we we've discovered that no matter how complex you make the graphics, no matter how complex you make the simulation, all of these interfaces can be boiled down to very basic interactions of like, ah, uh, it's an extension of a chat room. It's an extension of a message board. You know, the the tool, the underlying tool and what its purpose is, what like because how our bodies interact with it doesn't change there's only so many like modulations of that. Um, and so basically until we have some sort of like bio interface, anything else that we build that is a social electronic network is just going to be some new iteration of a chat room or a message board. Yeah, I mean, you're you're making, you know, clearly your world is about very sort of long form kind of thesis building and, and explanation dynamics, right? But you're making some interesting points as you kind of walk through that um, to the point of, you know, and, and this kind of actually gets back to that question when Charlie was playing the game in terms of like, uh, I think a lot about the perception of companies that are actually just software layers that are actually yeah. just a piece of software built on some sort of fundamental data pipe network that we now call the internet, right? That used to be called the World Wide Web or the information superhighway or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We had different nomenclatures for it. 
um, that were that were sticky for a period of time, uh, and and even the, you know the evolution evolves, and we've settled on the internet as kind of this yeah. very very populist name that that covers a lot of it. But when you think about how suspect and how at risk a company that builds itself on top of effectively just a layer of software, whether that's a graphic you know, simulation or some sort of social dynamic of a chat room, and you see that this evolution of the social media Twitter dynamic can be so easily toppled or, or starting to very much teeter something that people thought, oh, Twitter is always going to be Twitter. It's always going to be there. And here comes another sort of lookalike product of Twitter. And because of some social dynamics and sort of awareness of people's personalities, it kind of moves the needle really quickly, right? Yeah. Um, much more than a traditional company with traditional products and services that build multiple layers. On, and they very often have a software layer on top of all that. But companies that are literally just software layers, I think, is kind of what you're referring to and probably breaks into some of your discussions around crypto and blockchain. And, you know, because there's an underlying technology of blockchain that I think a lot of us believe is very important, the trackability of assets in a world where we have so many assets. But the layer of crypto as a speculative asset um, is, is a software layer on top of that, right? No different than any other stock investment that anybody makes from a speculation standpoint. It's what do you believe that company represents, right? Yeah. And the challenge with crypto is it doesn't really represent a lot right now other than pure speculation, other than people believing that as long as we hold water at this price point, it will be worth something someday. Am I- Yeah, yeah there's sort of a right? terrifying realization over the last few years that like really the soul of uh, the soul of the modern economy is gambling. We're all gambling addicts at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's... Uh, that's a that's a thing to drink in, I guess. Um, so at the time you were talking about the concerns, very valid about you know what is really crypto and what's really going on here. Um, were were you in the world of gambling? Were you speculating in it at the same time? To your point about World of Warcraft and other games, you are a hundred percent right in terms of the fact that the media industry typically and people that are executives in an industry that have had some degree of success will cursory tap into a zeitgeist and feel like they've built enough expertise to go and try and make some sort of media product out of it. And it often fails. Mm -hmm. uh, where we see it correctly is when occasionally a media company will really get it right and bring the right people involved in it, like so deeply connected to it. And I'm referring to the, the TV show on HBO, Last of Us, where they actually brought the creator of the yeah. game to help them craft this the series and that worked um, and that one's close to me like literally like i'm i'm in calgary where they where they oh, filmed yeah. that so like yeah. tons of my friends uh tons of my friends worked on i know i asked you three or four uh, things there, so the i don't show. know how you want to attack. um i've lost track yeah there was a lot in there uh and and i've lost track of what the last well, one was crypto, because we crypto speculation on the last of us. as you were debunking and and dealing with the the issues of what it was were you an investor in crypto simultaneously or not? Uh, no, I was never. I was never a crypto investor in in the way of like it's like ah, I'm gonna get into this to try to make uh, try to make money. I used crypto like so. I, I I have hands on experience with it, and I used it um, for its true purpose, buying drugs over the internet um, back <laughs> when. Uh, <laughs> There you go, the dark web. That is exactly and, the purpose. That's right. Uh, so, so I had hands-on experience with it for uh, you know back when it was um, uh, not not at its like rawest. Like if we're talking like 2011 through like 2015 ish. Like uh, basically when there was still when when the myth of it as like money was still mm -hmm. like alive before like seven seven transactions so per second became like ATMs truly and untenable yeah, and I remember before, those days. Yeah, sure. you know when it's like when people were still pre pretending that you would actually like buy stuff with it mm -hmm. and i was like it's like okay like this seems important this or, or this seems like you know this seems like an important thing to know about and these are big claims so we should like you know like let's try the hands-on um and you know going through the process it was just it's like okay like this is this is 
years and years and years and years and years away from uh, away from like public viability because the number of hoops that you need to jump through in order to do basically like anything uh, are really only tenable in the context of I'm trying to buy something that I cannot get at a store uh, because, you know, the government won't, uh, uh, the government has some like umbrage with that. Yeah. So uh, basically like, unless, unless you get LSD in the mail two weeks later, uh, crypto like just wasn't worth actually like <laughs> using, you know, it was too, it, it yeah. was too cumbersome. It was too slow. There was too many like layers of just, it turns out that a trustless exchange of commerce is like a huge pain in the ass because it's like, ah, Nobody at any stage of this trusts each other. And so every stage of the transaction has to be like this knives out situation yeah. where like Eris is like, ah, are you who you say you are? Are you? Are you really who you say you are? And it's just, it's so aggressive. It's so like, it's so pointlessly inefficient that it's completely untenable for any, like, it turns out trust is a good thing and we use trust a lot. Like trust is a human tool that we have built for good reason. Um, and, and it serves a purpose and uh, stripping it out of like completely stripping it out of society is one uh, really inefficient and two, a just terrible idea. Um, and uh yeah, I'm just kind of like rambling about some of the philosophical stuff now. But like, yeah, no, so I had like hands on experience with crypto in terms of its like usability and viability as what it was claiming to be at the time, which was a replacement, like which was digital dollars, you know, uh, and and of course, that didn't pan out. Nobody adopted it. Nobody who was holding it was willing to and, spend it. And also, it, spend in it. It the end, bad. there are digital dollars and there will be more there, of them. So why would you use Bitcoin yeah. instead of a digital dollar unless you were going to do, you know, and I live in that privacy. Yeah. And living in Canada, you know, we're on the forefront. Uh, like we're basically the world's test bed for uh, electronic um, electronic payment methods um due to some quirks of how our banking system is set up and the fact that we're an english language country that's right next to the u.s but we're not the u.s and so it's it's complicated but so we've had you know like i've had uh i've had an electronic debit card since the 90s yeah, right me too. Well, um you know and we we got chip cards seven eight years before uh before people in the states had even like heard about them mm -hmm. um and so so very much like from that standpoint, it was like, I already have electronic currency. I already like, we already had the, uh, the like interactive direct pay system where, you know, you could just like go to your bank, like send somebody money instantly bank account to bank account, um, you know, via an app on your phone. Yeah. Well, Dan, uh, Dan, wouldn't you say that you actually are using cryptocurrency because what you described is cryptocurrency but one backed with substance and good management and what you really attacked was cryptocurrency based on poor leaders and no substance right so crypto no, because crypto cryptocurrency so like electronic currency and cryptocurrency aren't the same thing and like people well, like a not? lot of people it's heavily encrypted. involved hmm? i mean what you describe as electronic currency is encrypted um it's digital uh, there's actually not as much gold in the, in the bank of Canada as you'd imagine, but it has the sovereign backing. If you remove the sovereign backing, you actually end up with the same BS as non-sovereign backed crypto. So all the technologies are the same, just these startups have nothing backing them. But it is, it is, you know, it call, I mean, I think the I mean, but I would say, but the thing is, is that like, you know, like, so, so my air quote opponents like the people on the other side of the uh the other side of the crypto uh conversation the people heavily invested in it like like emotionally and philosophically invested in it i i think they would take umbrage with the uh with like and and i know that they would because i have seen them like i have been on their message boards where they take umbrage with the connection of like ah like a, basically what you just said of like it's like what's the difference between you know a debit card and and cryptocurrency and they have a lot of uh you know it's like well it's all encrypted and they would say it's like that's just you're you're just like playing word games like they would say that you're playing word games at that point because it's like sure like 
encryption is involved, but encryption is involved in any kind of thing. Like that's not what they would, they would shout. That's not what we're talking about. But see, Dan, um, your thing has so, the bank of Canada and Canadian government behind it. And their thing has nothing but air. And that's oh, yeah. Yeah. Awful. No, I, I mean, that's like you, you have a very valid point in, I just think that there, it is worth like, I'm, I'm going to bat for the cryptocurrency folks and saying that like they would disagree with this yeah, yeah. connection of the two because they would assert that their thing has its own unique properties that are very distinct to it. Yeah, it used sure. to be like blockchain and like, you know, the public availability of, uh, of transactions and, you know, this myth of being able to like locate like where every single dollar is located well, a, and, and being very, able to identify a specific. So, bill, so we're know, running, yeah. we're running out of time. We are. Yeah, there's a lot to it turns this out that if fun. we want to talk about AI, crypto, the metaverse and like <laughs> tech hype, it, uh, those are like kind of big subjects that yes, are really easy are. to burn and, through an hour. on. And and I will tell you, I did some research, not as much as some of the other uh, podcasts that you've been on that, by the way, uh, were much more popular than this one, um, but not as good. Uh, but I did have a couple of things that I just wanted to bring up. First of all, um, you do the entire production yourself, right? You're the head researcher, you're the performer, you're the producer, you're the director, you're the editor, uh, and you also do wardrobe, which I um, greatly admire. And I looked on the internet for that mini Tonka sweatshirt. So um, if, if you can't tell me where to get one, I'll buy yours off of you. <laughs> you you can get that that Lake Minnewanka sweatshirt by going to like it's it's their uh, it's their tourist merch. So if you actually like I bought it at the boathouse at Lin Lake Minnewanka. Um, OK, yeah. well, I may may follow up with you because I had some trouble tracking it down. That was oddly specific, Charlie. Very, I know. I it's can't a help great it. The whole sweatshirt. time I was watching it's a great the video. Sweatshirt. I, and it was really cold here while I was watching it. I said, I want that sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah. So I picked that up uh, because I did a, I did a video about flat earth where we went out to I Lake know, I saw it, yeah. and um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm largely a solo operation though. These days I'm, I'm dabbling with like, I've, I've hired a co-writer to work on a couple of videos with me. I've hired a, I've hired an assistant to, um, to help me with like, some logistical executive stuff but like mm -hmm. yeah for years and years and years it was literally like a one man uh uh one man show and it's still you know i'm still like your lead writer you know v like uh, i i do the video i do the yeah and how many years how many years have you been at this 13 so when you started out you were reviewing movies and video games right I was approaching, so I I was reviewing movies and video games in in kind of the like raw version of the word review in like look back at. Um, I was approaching it very much from a um, really like a language arts, uh, you know. Well, you're more uh, of a cultural like writing like critic. book reports. Yeah, it was so I was approaching it from a cultural standpoint. I was approaching it from a narratological standpoint of like what do these things have to say about like the the art and act of storytelling the art and act of narrative and um and uh and and that would go in like a lot of different directions i i made the channel kind of like deliberately broad from the outside for like from the outset 13 years ago specifically because i knew that like my attention would wander and that over a long enough period of time like i you know it's like i I, I wasn't going to be reviewing like werewolf movies for 15 years straight or something like that. I just knew that like my brain wouldn't stay, uh, wouldn't stay focused and like society was going to change. I was going to change. And so I l made the channel purposefully broad so that I could, uh, I could drift as, as things. Uh, and now it's werewolves and vampires. Now it's werewolves and vampires and occasionally Lamia really underappreciated, uh, uh, uh fantastic monster the lamia that's very that's a very deep geek reference which is awesome uh, and, and leaving, 
Okay. We'll leave it to the geeks who are listening uh, to look up what Mamiya is. Uh, that's our show for this week. Uh, thank you, Dan, for joining us. So much more to talk to you about. But thank you for having me. This was I, I hope it didn't get too uh, too confrontational, but it was uh, it was nice and heated and uh, and a great way of starting a Friday morning. Uh, and it was energetic. That's the way I put it. It was very it was very energetic. And I uh, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for being here, man. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.